Welcome to Witch Lit, a place to talk about the craft of writing and writing the craft. I'm your host, Victoria Rashke, author, publisher, witch, and nosy Scorpio. You can support Witch Lit and the serious book habit it requires at ko-fi.com slash witchlitpodcast. And you can be part of the show by sending in your own death, sex, religion, politics, money questions for our guests to Victoria at witchlitpod.com. If you like what we're doing here, please subscribe and give us a rating or review wherever you listen to podcasts. It really does help other witches find the show. Here's to never getting to the bottom of our to be red piles. Elisa Einhorn is an astrologer, astrology blogger, poet with an MFA from the Iowa Writers Workshop, tarot reader, tarot teacher, and student studying psychoanalysis. She's the author of two books, The Little Book of Saturn from Wiser and A Mystical Practical Guide to Magic, Instructions for Seekers, Witches, and Other Spiritual Misfits from Llewellyn. She recently finished her third book, A Memoir and is Agent Hunting. Elisa makes her home in Brooklyn and is on the verge of getting a dog. Elisa Einhorn, <laughs> welcome to Witchlet. Hi, Victoria. Thank you. I think that's the first I'm time I had that long bio. <laughs> I was going to say, I think it's the first time I had someone laugh while I read their bio. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> so, our writing first question, bios is weird. It is weird, and I hate it. I'd rather write a book. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> so, our first question for everyone on the show is you know, in this age of social media and video, TikToks, and all of that. Why still write books? Why write? Oh, man. What? That is, that question is very meaningful to me. I think it's essential. It's more important than ever. And now, you if you watch the news at all, or, you know, you see the news on your phone, there's all these uh, scary articles about AI, you know, whether, whether it's good or bad and, and what it means. Uh, well, I think writers, we, we can't not write. We have to write. So the rest of it actually doesn't really matter. If you're a writer, if you're a real writer, you're going to write. With an audience, without an audience, success, publishing, whatever that means to any particular person, you're, you're still going to do it. You can't not do it. But I do think it's bigger than that, that we can't. And I was going to say, uh, have we already, have we already devolved into a world of, like you mentioned, TikTok, you know, reels, reels and, and tweets? Uh I'm not sure. Maybe there's room for everything. I don't I don't know the numbers on this, but small publishing independent presses they're they're flourishing, aren't they? And mm-hmm. I maybe maybe there's room for it all. But it it terrifies me to think that writers would stop writing and also that writers that that books would be just books of tweets or <laughs> books of glorified blog posts rather than uh, I'm trying to think of a non condescending word. <laughs> yeah, well, just I think more thought out and I don't know. Yeah. Organized. More organized. More organized, maybe. Like when we were before before we started, uh, before you started recording. Mm-hmm. Now I forget what I was gonna say. Oh, you were you were saying something about my uh my magic book, uh and how it was, I forget the words you used. It was woven together or thread through or something. And I was mm-hmm. saying to you, well, I, I did that on purpose. Like what, whatever you see there was not, uh, I mean, of course, inspiration happens, but it it was thought through. It was planned, mm-hmm. like storyboard kind of planning. There, There's nothing accidental except for grammar errors <laughs> in that book. It's completely uh, 
I have a Virgo moon. I have a lot of Virgo in my chart. It's very organized, very mm-hmm. thought out. So it made it made me happy that you noticed it. Yeah. And and for listeners um who haven't read your book yet, and I hope they will go read it because it is lovely. Um there it it is a book on what I would think is like kind of a practical approach to magic with this mystical un- underpinning of tarot and astrology that's woven through all sections of the book. It's not just, here's my section on tarot, here's my section on astrology, and then we move on to the next thing. It's like you set up those two like underpinnings for all of the work in the book and then you use them throughout. And I think I said, it's like a tapestry. <laughs> so mm. yeah. And um, yeah, I, 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 it really shows. And I'm unsurprised to find out that you have a lot of Virgo energy. My partner and my son are both <laughs> Virgos and I'm steeped in it all the time. Aww. So um, I, 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 lo- <laughs> I, lo- I love me some, I love me some Virgos. <laughs> <laughs> so. I always say hashtag too much Virgo. Yeah. I've got, yeah. It reminds me, I have a, a client with um, Virgo, just just Virgo rising. And she always says to me, like, she wishes she had more. Mm-hmm. <laughs> she yeah. wants more Virgo placements. Kind of yeah, thing. I admire the, uh, I don't know, it's not even like single-mindedness of Virgos because they're not quite, they're not stubborn in the way I think of like Taurus people because I have Taurus rising and I can be stubborn yeah we're not they're we're much, not like you <laughs> yeah they're much more um they're much more methodical and um like everything is kind of based on reason and if you approach them with like well this is why I think your reasoning is flawed and give them an actual mm-hmm. reason they will be like oh yeah you're right I mean they will readjust mm. or Taurians I think just like bulldoze through on their opinion yeah (laughs) yeah Taurus puts their foot down and that's it yeah there there was a time I I oh sorry go on oh no no go ahead I was just gonna say I had this Taurus friend she was a mega mega Taurus and whenever I had to say call the phone company to argue about a charge you know some kind of uncomfortable miserable phone call I would ask her to do it (laughs) <laughs> because she would just be this impenetrable wall who would not take no for an answer and would just sit. And she did it for me. She would just sit there mm-hmm. on the phone like, no, let me talk to you know someone else and just and be a wall. Yeah. Virgo's not the same kind of wall. Yeah. Yeah. If you if you give them a good reason, out. they'll back down. But if they know they're right and they have <laughs> facts to back it up, they're not going to back down, which I appreciate. So. Yeah, because my husband is the person who does the uh, make all the phone calls, uncomfortable phone calls for mm. services and stuff, because he's like that. He's like, no, no, no. Here's the, all the reasons. Um, so, yeah, I appreciate that. <laughs> and you know what? It's not a reasonable world. That's where Virgos get. I mean, again, I'm, I'm not a Virgo son, but I, mm-hmm. I, I'm 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 on their team. But it's not a reasonable world. So Mm-mm. we get disappointed. Or we get yes. we get frustrated because we because we are yes. we are reasonable and then we're faced with the world which is something yeah. else. No, I was talking to my son yesterday on the phone and I, I can't even remember what we were discussing, but it was something like I was like, but and gave all these reasons for whatever we were talking about was insane to me, and he was like, "Mom, you're bringing logic to a stupid fight." <laughs> and I was like, mm. "Yep." Yep. 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 I know. So, uh, but yeah, uh, on, on the course to writing, I suspect you and I will be tangential a lot. Um, but I feel I it already. I feel my brain going in these, well, cause you're a water sign. I'm a water. Sign. I, I feel yes. it already. I feel the, whoosh, we're yes, exactly. <laughs> um, but I do want to like, cause you, you've published two books already that yeah. probably I'm guessing did not immediately come out of doing an MFA in poetry from the Iowa Writers Workshop. So you published the little bit of decades in between. Yeah. So what did that, what did your arc of being published look like? Oh my God. Yeah. So I, I got that degree when I was really young. So I'm a, I'm a, I'm a couple of years older than you. I'm not okay. going to reveal the number okay. on your show. I have revealed my number on the show so people will be able to guess. <laughs> All right. So maybe, maybe they'll, maybe they're, they're not thinking about it. So I'm a, I'm a little, I'm a smidge older than, than you are. And I got my MFA 
in poetry in my early 20s. So that mm -hmm. was a really long time ago. You may have been and at, I was, at Iowa with friends of mine yeah. that I went to undergrad with. Yeah, because I had oh, several really? undergrad friends mm -hmm. go to Iowa. Yeah, we'll have to chat about that later. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, we can. I'm, I'm curious now. But I, uh, I was a, a frustrated poet later on in my 30s, a frustrated playwright, always trying, you know, trying to and I did. I had some I had some poems published in journals. It was my entire identity. It was my entire world. I had no skills. You know, I like I was just a poet. I was mm -hmm. just a uh, trying to figure out <laughs> what that was pre-social media. And this is a long time ago. There, I mean, there were no cell phones. Mm hmm. When I, when I got my MFA, there were, there were no, I think there were word processors. My mother had bought me this typewriter that was a little different than an electric typewriter. Like it had some other special feature to it. You know, it was a completely different world. Anyway, so I was trying to figure out how to do that. And I kept trying. I'm leaving details out of my life story for you for the sake of brevity and to keep the <laughs> audience from the listeners, the <laughs> listeners from falling asleep. So fast forward. I'm in my early 30s. I'm living in New York. I'm still I'm still a frustrated poet, less frustrated playwright actually. I had more uh I don't know, success with that with getting my work out there. But then I fell in love with astrology. And that was this turning point. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know what? Forget about this. I'm I'm not going to write anything. And this was when blogs were new. Like blogs were the thing. The, it, there were some astrologers on YouTube, but not that many. Instagram didn't exist yet, for sure. TikTok didn't exist. Social media was a different place then. And I, I made this decision. All right, I'm not going to bang my head against the wall anymore. I made the crazy decision to become an astrologer. And I thought, I'm only going to write my, my, my blog. That's it. I'm, I'm quitting this other stuff because it's just not, it's too frustrating. But I, I loved astrology so much. That I committed to it. I remember the moment like it was yesterday. <laughs> and then, but then it was still years later before I did the Saturn book. Mm -hmm. So what prompted Many years that? later. What prompted them? So I was fairly, I'm less active on Facebook now. I was fairly active on, on, on Facebook and I would post um, weekly forecasts or just thoughts, you know, if they're if big astrological events, basically blog posts, public blog posts on my Facebook. And I had actually followed Judica Illis, who's quite famous mm -hmm. in the writing world, witchcraft world. I had followed her, I think, in 2014, just because I was a fan. It's like, oh, this this lady's cool. Um, so I had followed her. And then in, in 20, I don't know, was it 2016? Out of the blue, I must, and I must have been liking her post. So I showed up in her, she, she's an Aquarius rising. She's got a lot of friends on Facebook, but somehow posts of mine had showed up in her feed. And I think it was in 2016, out of nowhere, she sent me this message, which said, Elisa, do you write? And, you know, the heavens opened then it was just like this oh my god judica ellis wrote me and she just wrote me asking if i write and i <laughs> you know it's like oh shit what is so that that was the beginning because they they were looking for they i think they abandoned that plan but they were going to do a series of uh, astrology books you know little book of such and such planet and she said or we talked about it we said pick a planet write a proposal and maybe, maybe you'll write a book for us. So it was just out of the blue like that. Wow. And I remember too, it was around eclipse time because it was an eclipse post. So she just, and, th and that was her job too, was to look, you know, acquisitions editor to, to go around looking for, uh, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, it is, um, I don't know. I think, you know, a lot of us who can't, I mean, I, I did my, I did an MA in poetry and I ah. do think that there is a lot of this yeah. frustrated poet. I mean, when you were talking about just being <gasps> frustrated poet, I was saying, so my boyfriend at the time, I couldn't get I, a book out. I couldn't yeah, get a book it's, out. It's just I would enter contests and they, I would sometimes get good 
feedback. There was one like really nice reject, you know, nice mm-hmm. rejections. You paper your wall with nice rejections. So then I just quit after a while. I just, I couldn't, I couldn't take it anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I just, I don't know. But there was like a disillusionment to you, I think, because of that for me, at least there was a disillusionment for me. And I was like, I can't do this. My uh, boyfriend at the time when I finished my undergraduate degree in creative writing as a graduation present made me business cards that said unemployed poet, poet on them. <laughs> Yeah. And I was like, yeah, that's kind of true. And I had a kid. So like I had to figure out how to feed us. And um, so, yeah, I just kind of got disillusioned. And then honestly, I didn't write anything but blogs for like 20 years. So. Oh, so we had a similar path Mm -hmm. then. Yep. You know, I needed a yes. I needed a yes from the universe. Like I got more of a yes with my plays, much more of a yes. And I didn't know if I was going to get a yes doing astrology work, but. I did. Yeah. And then it was also money. Like it wasn't, and clients would find me because they liked my writing. They would read my blog and they mm-hmm. were attracted to that. Yeah. Sometimes you just need a yes and you need to know when to, I don't want to say to quit, but to, to do, to do whatever you're doing a little differently. Yeah. Redirect. Redirect. Yeah. 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 I do think it's really easy to go down that sunk cost fallacy i i instead of playwriting i went to culinary school like a idiot and like just burnt why, my... do, you, why do you say that well, like I, I mean it, that's not a great way to make money <laughs> cooking is not a great way to make money yeah. um but i loved it when i was doing it but it just like burnt my body out it's just it's a rough it's a rough game and it's hard on you so yeah i was like yeah mm. i can't mm-hmm. i can't do this forever so and then writing came back. I just like my son graduated from high school and and then got this little like interior knock on the door. It's like, hey, did you forget? So we can't not write. I, I mean, I'm still thinking yeah. about your first question. Writers, we that's that's how you know. Yeah. I I think <laughs> you can't not write, even if it's painful, even if it's crushing you, you have to do it. Yeah. I just changed. I just decided I wasn't a poet anymore. And now I write you know, mm. contemporary fantasy novels. So yeah, it was just, you know, just a change up. I think you're right. I think that, I don't know. It's, it's so hard because there is this sunk cost fallacy of like, I, I went to graduate school for this. This is who I, like you said, this was my, this is my identity as a person. I was like, I'm a poet. And yeah. then you're like, maybe that's not who I am. Maybe I am. I bet it shows up in your people. books though. I've had I bet people it's there. say I've had people say that, and I appreciate it because I'm like, well, at least it wasn't for naught. <laughs> so. And then I'm suddenly I'm I'm I feel like I'm mothering you. I apologize. Oh no, it's <laughs> because I'm about, to, I'm about to like nurture you. It's like, well, it wasn't for nothing. Like you had an experience. It 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 probably a uh, form for sure. It formed you in ways uh, then and now. Oh, yeah. Oh, definitely. I mean, in in the work itself and in the people and experiences I had, I mean, I one of the main things that came out of this and and you may have something like this, too, in your experience in grad school. um, When undergrad, I actually went to Slovenia with a group of writers Mm. and like that experience. And then I went back and did a year abroad in Slovenia and and now my books are set in Slovenia <laughs> and oh, like I, I, I have like I didn't lifelong go anywhere, but... <laughs> dear, I have lifelong dear friends and like this like part of my you know heart is always there and you know yeah it's just I mean that I think changed and shaped me a lot as a person and that was as much mm-hmm. about the writing as it was about the experience so but yeah so I'm guessing you are a person that introduces yourself as a double barrel person. Is that you're a you're double a, double barrel? You're a double barrel person. You're a you're a, a writer and you're an astrologer, tarot reader. That you, it is. I never know how. Do you separate I mean, them out? I never know how to. It's like depends who, like who you mean. I never, I never know how to. Now I'm thinking like, is there ever cause for me to introduce myself? You know these these days, like if I just met 
uh, I don't know, just some random person, I probably would say I was a student because that's easy for people to grasp. Mm-hmm. I'm a student. I'm older. I'm a non-traditional student. I've gone back to school, but I probably, I probably would say I'm an astrologer and a writer or astrologer and author. I don't tend to specify the tarot part, mm-hmm. although tarot is in everything I do. It's it is just like in the book, it's completely integrated. And in a way, I think, I don't want to say it surpassed astrology, but when I, when I do a reading, I, I, they're, it's both. Mm-hmm. I, I, I do them both. And there's, um, I, I think you get to a point if you're deep in with astrology or tarot, you, you start to think in it. Mm-hmm. And then It's a, that's like, I don't have an arm, you know, it's a, it's a tarot, it's a tarot (laughs) machine. I don't have a hand. It's, it's a tool to hold a deck of cards. Mm -hmm. It's, it's such a part of me. Yeah. Well, and I think that's one of the, thinking it. Yeah. It's one of the ways I love in the book that it's, it's a different, the way I think you approach tarot in the book is different than the way, like when I was getting to learn tarot that it was all these like big elaborate spreads and you had to learn like not only what the card meant but what that position yeah. meant in the spread and all this and i like this approach of like yeah, i'm, I'm just asking opposite. a question <laughs> and we're turning a card over to get an answer like that to exactly. me is like this much more and that's much more how i use tarot now um but initially you know it was like all about that celtic cross spread and what it meant and you know all that and now i'm like that's that's a lot of work <laughs> Like, it's I just funny because I, I do those now. Yeah, I fell I fell in love with that spread kind of late. I was a mm-hmm. little. I, now I, I I enjoy working with it and with my students, giving them. I want them to create their own spreads. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I do tend. I, there is a part of me, maybe that's the Virgo side, that thinks of the deck as a like a, it's a book you can open mm-hmm. for an answer. I mean, mm-hmm. it's really your intuition. You're really tapping into a stream, whether you call it the Akashic Records or the collective unconscious. There's a stream and you can float along that stream and you can get your answers and you you open the book. You open the book of cards and you you might only need one, one card mm-hmm. or two. I I try to strip it down for people. I mean that that's how I do it, but I think I think it takes some of the um uh the mystique away like it, it leaves the mysticism is still there the mysticism or the mystery is still there but it takes away the uh like thinking that you need anything other than yourself like you don't you don't need any education you don't even need a tarot book you can you can know nothing and just be responding to the images mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I've always kind of had, cause I've had people, I mean, I don't do readings for people very often. Um, I, I mostly just use them for myself, but I have done some public reading, you know, like for charity kind of stuff. I'll do that. Or I, mm-hmm. friends will ask occasionally and I'll do it. But the thing that people always ask in those settings is, well, is this, you know, is this magic? Do you believe this is like, are we talking to spirits or whatever? And I was like, you know, I'm like, I, I'm a skeptic at heart, but I still believe <laughs> in, you know, something that I can't explain or understand. And I said, I don't know mm. that it matters to me. If mm, you, that's if a good answer. Spirits, or if we're talking, like you said, if you're tapping into the collective unconscious or whatever, I said, you could just be having a conversation with yourself and you're finding out things you couldn't get to without some exterior that's prompt. True. So, which that, that's a way to read. Thing. I consider yeah. that like, that's, that's one way to read, but then there is this, then there is the other way, which mm-hmm. is the stream. Yeah. I mean, I call it the stream because say, like, if you, if you're the kind of person who gets readings from different people and they're telling you the same or similar things, Mm -hmm. it's because they, you know, they're, they've just, they've tapped in and they, and I'm talking about predictive things and they're seeing, I tend to believe in, in fate more than free will. And we have this sort of like little bit of wiggle room, (laughs) which I don't, I don't think it's a particularly fashionable viewpoint i don't know it It seems like it's more fashionable these days maybe maybe it's just who i'm talking to (laughs) (laughs) 
I feel, I'm not in the loop so, so much, but it, it, at least there was a time where people are very into free. We have thinking, thinking they have more control than, than they do. Yeah. Which is so, I don't know. I think I hold both those things in my head at the same time. I think some things are just bound to happen. And then I'm also like chaos theory is a thing that, you know, every, Mm -hmm. every decision we make changes the path we're on, like whether or not to get up at a certain time or whatever. So I think they overlap a little bit. I like the doctor who approach is there. There are some things that have to happen in time. There are a set point in time and then things can kind of wiggle around between those things that have to happen. I think that's true. Um, I think that's true. Yeah. Doctor who is a life philosophy. No, (laughs) Yeah, no, I never watched it. I never, I never, I mean, I know, I know of the show, but I, yeah. I know I, yeah, I watched from, you know, early years, that's true. Tom Baker on PBS when it was only <laughs> channel we could get in our tiny little town. So yeah, it's, um, but yeah, I think I, I love that approach. And I do think it's interesting for people who, who do get readings from other people to go to different, to different folks and get, get multiple insight. I mean, I've had readings I thought were really good. And then I've had some like, meh, whatever. But there's a couple oh, that have sure. stayed with me and I'm like, oh yeah, he was hundred percent right. And I didn't listen, you know, like those kind of, those hmm. kind of stay with you. So, um, so you have these multiple threads that you're weaving your tapestry with now as a writer and astrologer and a tarot reader and teacher and a student of psychoanalysis and I can't help but feel that becoming a student of psychoanalysis might have come out of those things. <laughs> so, you know, that's what, when, when I was enrolling, when I was, I was uh, just starting some of a couple people associated with the school had said similar things like to them, it made sense. Mm-hmm. Like it was a natural outgrowth, but I, I didn't make the connection. Now, now I do, now that I know more, now that I've had, I mean, it's just been one semester. We're starting spring semester mm-hmm. in a couple of weeks. But uh, before I knew anything about it, I thought they were completely different. I mean, other than I, I talk to people for a living now doing readings. And if I f- finish the training, get licensed and become an analyst, then I would continue to talk to people for a living but I didn't, I didn't see what they saw until I knew more. Mm-hmm. Cause you know, what's funny is this work that I do now, it is all about the intuition, which I try to teach in the book. You know, tarot can make you psychic. You just have to practice. You just have to be very practical and you're going to grow that muscle. And it's not so mysterious. It's just, it's, it's, it's practical. And to me, that's normal in our world, like our world of astrologers and card readers and witches and all that. You know, it's mm-hmm. sort of like, oh, yeah, intuition, no kind of no big deal, even though there's this uh, there's a variation, you know, whose intuition is really spot on reliably. And 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 then there's people where, you know, they're, it's not their thing, but it's you know <laughs> what I'm saying? Like, it's still just, oh, yeah, intuition, no big deal. But when I started I wish I could remember exactly, but I just I, I I got the feeling from just listening to conversations among students or or, or others associated with the school, like this, like intuition, like yes, intuition, like it wasn't. I think for us it becomes more commonplace or or every day, and for them, it's more special or like a little bit. Uh, you know, intuition is not evidence-based, not that they talk about things being evidence-based so much, but we don't, we don't usually talk of mental health professions and the importance of intuition, you mm-hmm. know, yeah. and here were these people saying, oh yes, intuition, we need to bring that in. Or I, I forget. And I'm thinking that's what I do every mm-hmm. single day. And you're telling me that's valuable to you guys too. Okay. I guess I'm in the right place but I've already, it's what I've already been doing. Yeah. So do you feel like now that you've kind of had that realization that there is that connection, is that, has that changed like how you look at psychoanalysis or is it changed how you look at your work with astrology and tarot or is it just kind of now a piece? I think I don't know what it means yet. Yeah. It's a piece. Mm -hmm. It, It was a, 
it was a nice piece to discover. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know how it. I don't know how it fits in yet because you know I'm so new. Yeah, I just I keep saying you know, I, I don't know anything about this. I just <laughs> oh. had two classes and I'm I'm learning and I just I I had a it was a preconceived notion. I I didn't think that they thought intuition played a part or that it even did. You know, I was thinking analysis, the Virgo part, mm-hmm. and then to find out that it's and also there's different. Um, orientations or, you know, schools within psychoanalysis today. So some may uh, talk about that more than others, or, or, or it, it might come into the, the conversation. I mean, I, I, I think if, if, if you're going to talk about emotion, intuition is not that far behind, but, mm-hmm. you know, I don't, I don't know how it all fits in yet. And I often joke or not really joke that, you know, I don't know if I'll live to finish. It's a long program. Yeah. It, it's, it's really long, really. Like if I, I always say, if, 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 if I s- stick with this, this is the rest of my life. This is the path of the rest of my life, no matter what else I do. Yeah. So I don't, I don't know yet. So we'll have to keep having this conversation a couple of years yes. from now. <laughs> See, all, all, the, all the questions that you're asking are still in my brain. Like I'm still thinking yeah. about first one about writers and now this one, they're all, yeah. they're all on the stove. They're all simmering. Well, and I, I do think that is, it's like part, I mean, I don't, I, I have had encountered people who think writers are magical unicorns. I don't think we are magical unicorns. I think that we just have a different. Wait a minute. Wait, wait. I think we have a different are you perspective. Sure? I, I don't think that <laughs> is magical. What do they mean? What, but, what do they well, mean by just that? that I, the impression has like, oh, I could never do that. Or that's just like, maybe they- like weird, like these weird anomaly people in the stream of people they've encountered in their life. And I'm like, I guess because I've known so many writers and realized that we are all very mm. different. You know, people always like, oh, the brooding writer in their garret. We are all you know, different. And I'm like, you know, yeah, but I have writer friends who are like the most outgoing extroverted people I know among writer friends. So I was like, I, I, there's not like a type in the, in the people I know who are writers, but I do think that there is a perspective that when you, when you become a writer or when you are a writer, however you look at it, because I've had people argue for both sides of that, that you just tend mm, to then look at the world differently. You look at the world differently. You're either trying to find the thread or the story or something sparks your imagination. And, and I think that other artists have that same experience. Ours, we just do it with words instead of paint or a camera or whatever. But, um, but yeah, I do think that it's hard, the older I've gotten and, and looked at things that way to not eventually realize that all of these things I kept in separate buckets, you know, my writing, my witchcraft, my spirituality, because somehow I managed to separate witchcraft and spirituality. I don't know how I did that. Hmm. And, you know, my relationships, everything is in a separate bucket. And then at some point in my thirties, I just realized, oh, that is not working. <laughs> that is not how this, it's all, you know, it all weaves together and, and comes together. And I think mm-hmm. the older I've gotten, the more that's been true for me is that it's like these things I tried so desperately to keep separate. I was like, oh no, it's all connected. You, you you can't keep the the it's it's a tapestry it's it's not you know like plumbing <laughs> so yeah yeah it's all of a piece mm-hmm. it can make it hard to market it then or to to write a bio yeah because of that yeah like well, I never like- I could never I yeah well, I was just gonna say I I could never figure out how to describe what I do like mm-hmm. on my website, you know, specifically. And then I, I figured it out last year, but it took me a decade to find some words <laughs> that, that made yeah. sense to me that were accurate. Yeah. It, it's because funny. of all the threads. Cause I, I have that same question when people ask me what I do and I've gotten better about just saying I'm a writer. Cause it, even though it's something that people don't always know what to do with, it's, it's an easy thing to say. Because like, I'm a writer, I have a little publishing business with my husband, you know, I do a podcast, I, you know, 
also do you you know this weird embroidery thing on the side and then I do like I have a day job <laughs> a little tiny day job but I still have a day job where I work in data right. for nonprofits so like you know I, I am all of these things but what I've decided is all of those feed the writing and that's the easiest way to introduce myself is I'm a writer so you don't even say writer and podcaster not usually because people are like oh you have a podcast and then i tell them what it is and they just (laughs) stare into space at me so yeah and honestly i'm such a hermit these days i don't meet that many new people (laughs) so other than through the podcast (laughs) i i i i appreciate that people are going about their world but i'm really desperately trying not to get covid so i'm still pretty Mm. pretty much a hermit so you haven't oh. had it? I have not. <laughs> so, and unfortunately, oh, wow. uh, my son had it and has long COVID and that made me even more paranoid. Aww. So, um, yeah, so I've just been really trying to avoid it. So, I mean, we do stuff. We, you know, we, I go to museums, we go on hikes, we, we do stuff or not really, my husband's not a hiker. We go on walks, I will say. Um, but I don't really encounter a lot of new people because I'm not really putting myself in positions where that happens very often. So, which is one of the things I enjoy about the podcast because I do get to meet new people. <laughs> so. Yeah, and you don't have to, we don't have to leave our houses. No, no. Then I can talk to anybody in the world, which is kind of amazing. I mean, I think about what you were talking about when you went to grad school. Yeah, when I was in grad school, like I did weirdly have a cell phone. I had a bag phone in my car because I was commuting almost an hour to grad school when my son was a baby and my mom wanted to be able to call me. So I had a bag phone in the car, like a weird, you know, seventies detective or something. So, you know, I vaguely remember my mother having some kind of, I don't even know what year this is, some kind of phone uh, in the car, but I don't, I don't remember what she called it or any, anything about it, except that it was big. Yeah, it was it was like the size of like a desk phone in an office now, but it was oh, just maybe. in a in a like a zippered bag with a big did antenna. They, and, did yeah. they plug it into the ash? Not the ashtray. The um the lighter. Yeah, in the car. Yeah, you <laughs> plugged it into the lighter for power. Okay, so my mom yeah. had one of those. Yeah, which, which is crazy to think about now. You know, it's like because I have my phone is basically a, a palm top computer and mm-hmm. you know back in the day it was this you know it you could make calls on it and it was the size of you know your macbook yep. in your car so yeah it's crazy to think about yeah things have changed a lot and <laughs> yes, you know, it's have. just it's weird to think about like how that i think it, it's interesting to me as a writer too to think about technology like it, i don't i think it shows up in poetry too but it really shows up in fiction this idea of like how many novels from before the time of cell phones could the plot basically be solved in the first 10 pages if someone had had a cell phone hmm. and then how do you change that you know in a in a world where we're connected all the time you know how do you how do you tell those kind of stories so you know i think there's going to be a movement i keep predicting it a movement of of people who back away from the tech mhm as the oh, tech yeah. gets more and more and more, whatever it's going to become more AI ish or what, whatever's, whatever's in store for us. And I, I think that's where I'm going to be. <laughs> I'm going I'm to, I'll still have my cell phone, but I'm going to be one of those people that doesn't, uh, I don't, I've never even used TikTok. And then sometimes I think, oh, I really need TikTok for this. Usually it's a complaint, though. If I want to complain about (laughs) the mayor or the government, like, gee, maybe I should. But I never think of it for what I what I I don't know. Yeah, I might have to embrace it at, at some point. But there's a lot of resistance in me with that. Yeah. And I think as you know, in this world of, you know, writers that basically have to be their own marketers because that's how it is now it's not like the old yes, days where you would get that. you know <laughs> plane tickets to your book tour and you know it's just a very different world and mm-hmm. like i have a uh, incognito uh catch only as my friend says a uh, tiktok account which i have deleted from my phone um i just it's it's a time suck and i i 
don't, I didn't feel like I was getting enough useful things out of it to add that to what already existed. <laughs> Your daily life. Yeah. It's other, like, other yeah. people's lives. Yeah. It's, it's like, why I'll feel that if I'm just on, you know, some other platform and I'm, I'm doing that scrolling and then I'll stop like, why, why am I looking <laughs> As I said in the bio, I'm thinking about getting a dog, right? Mm -hmm. But but other people's German shepherds. How many reels can a person watch? It just <laughs> yeah. Get the dog. Don't get the dog. But stop watching people with their dogs. Yes, I mean I have a cat, and I still watch reels of other people's cats. So yeah, it's. I mean it. It is like it's a time suck, and I just kind of realized. I think probably before Christmas this past year, we had gone to see my son and we came back and I was just like, I had been on the plane and like I had this great plan to get so much work done. And then I wound up just kind of like not doing anything productive on this, like, you know, five and a half hour flight. And you know like, what? The brain is hungry. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah no, it's true. Like, and I was like, well, yeah, I need talking to over you. I don't know. Well, I mean, it's, you know, it's the it's, brain, the brain is hungry. The brain is hungry. I realized this with the school break. Mm-hmm. I mean, I was I was still reading uh, during the break uh, papers that I didn't I didn't get a chance to finish or other psychoanalytic stuff, but I was scrolling more, and I and then when you know the the new syllabi came out and I started choosing my classes and and I realized it it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. My my brain is it, it it wants it wants it wants so okay let me let me really give it some food instead of this I, I don't know what it is exactly <laughs> yeah and it's not even it's not even that good it's of course not even good snacks like and straight I, sugar sour vein kind of thing yeah <laughs> and I sound really I sound really anti but I, I mean I love YouTube I'm always. Mm -hmm. Because there's amazing, there's amazing, amazing teachers, spiritual teachers. Um, there's so there's so much good on on YouTube. Yeah, well, I think that's what it came to for me. Is like I there are value in these things, but I have to curate what is actually a yeah. value. Like just scrolling a feed doesn't serve that purpose. Mm -hmm. Like it, it has to be intentional of what, what I want to get. And I could, otherwise, if you're just scrolling a feed, you know, I could fill that with my never ending to be red pile, which will fall over and murder me someday. Or, mm -hmm. um, you know, like podcasts. I mean, I, I obviously love podcasts. I'm addicted to them. I, I listen to podcasts all the time. I, I've got to the point where I listen to more podcasts than music, which still surprises me. And I'm sure 20 year old me is screaming somewhere about it, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I love hearing what other people have to say about something in a more nuanced and deeper way than you can get in a, in a TikTok video. Like, but YouTube is a great source for that. And I, and there, like you said, there's amazing content. People use YouTube to make programming that really no other traditional media source is going to pick them up and do, let them do that. So I really appreciate the stuff that people are doing on YouTube and other places like that and in podcasts. And so, yeah, I mean, there's, there's, I just feel like, you know, there's so much content out there. I need to be more intentional. And that was kind of the, the when I deleted TikTok off my phone. <laughs> so. See, and this, and this is why writers need to keep writing. We have to keep writing books because what, what we do is it's not YouTube. It's different. It's mm -hmm. completely different. It's a um, different brain process. Yep. That's true. I agree. Um, so in the expeditiousness of time, because I feel like you and I, <laughs> this could be like a 10 part podcast. I, I could just see it happening. <laughs> so um, <laughs> I, I want to give you an opportunity before we do our, um, oh. our final question, because I think you and I are going to go for a while on that one. I want to give you an opportunity to tell people Ooh, where they how can, exciting. where they can find you. Um, if you want to be found and um, what's coming up <laughs> for you. I'm really easy to find. Okay. I'm, I feel like I'm really easy to find, but maybe I'm not. Um, I'm probably most active on Instagram, but it's not, it's usually not filled with marketing. 
I mean, mm-hmm. I, I, I do make my living as an astrologer, but every post, like, it's not buy my class, you know, buy this, buy that. There's not a whole lot, lot of that. So if people follow me on Instagram, where I am, what the hell am I there? Aliza of Brooklyn. There's pictures of New York. There's stray thoughts. There's these days only an occasional selfie. There might be stuff about school with, you know, astrology things or tarot things. So Mm -hmm. it's, it's sort of a, a a loose, (laughs) lo-fi, raw, uh, daily life kind of thing, but not, not even daily. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I stress that it's like for people who want to avoid the buy this type of thing, which to me is everywhere. And I'm, and I don't like that. You know, I yeah. don't, I don't follow anyone. That's all uh, just selling. So sell, even though we all need to make a living, you know, this like yeah. selling, selling, selling gives me a headache. Um, I'm also on Twitter, but Twitter, I'm not so active there. And it has changed a lot since the changing of the guard. Yeah. That I don't even, I don't even know exactly what the changes are, but I can feel them. But I'm, mm-hmm. what am I? I'm Moon Pluto NYC on there. I always forget my, my blog because I am, st- mm-hmm. I am still blogging, but less than I used to, which is moonplutoastrology.com. And there they can get information about getting a reading, but they can, you know, DM me on any of those places. I'm, I'm still on Facebook under my real name, but I'm not, I don't post there so much. Yeah. Uh, content oh i have a patreon too cool which is a is a good thing a good thing in my life yeah well good well we'll make sure links for all that is in the show notes and people can get to that forgetting anything yeah i guess let me know and we'll we'll make sure we (laughs) add it (laughs) the the blog blog or or instagram yeah instagram i check regularly and honestly i don't even know why (laughs) like there's not that much going on there but yet I feel the need to check it. Yeah. Yeah. It, Instagram's kind of become my main, like, put, that's my main output on social media. Um, weirdly, I, I, yeah, I kind of haven't, I also deleted Twitter from my phone. I think so. Mm. I just, Good I'm job. kind of like in this wall of social media and I'm kind of enjoying it. Like, I feel like I'm a lot saner as a human being right now. Um, but yeah, so we'll put links for all that. And if you think of anything else, let me know and I can add it to it. Okay. And then um, we'll do our last question, which is a tiny game of chance. And oh. we, already, we already pointed out that, you know, raised a Southerner. So there was this idea that there were things we were not <laughs> supposed to talk about in polite company, which are, as a Scorpio, my favorite things to talk about. <laughs> which oh, yeah, are, I said no politics. <laughs> yeah. So if you get if you get a four, I always say there's no rules to this game. You can say, I don't want to answer that question. Reroll. Um, okay. So I, I like to be a little bit of a chaos person too. Um, All so right. I will roll I'm a die. With that. And depending on what number I get, you'll get a question about death, sex, religion, politics, or money. And if I roll a six, <laughs> you get to pick which one you want. So. Oh, I'm excited. You got one death. Oh, <laughs> definitely my, not politics. My topic, my topic. <laughs> yeah. So I was thinking about this because you are a poet and because in the book you recommend in your suitcase at the end of each chapter for readers who haven't read the book yet. Um, Elisa gives you a, a, what she carries in her suitcase on that topic. And one of the chapters you talk about poetry and you specifically talked about Another Republic, which is one of the books I continue oh. to read throughout my life. It's a great book. It's a great book. And and having spent a lot of time in Eastern Europe with Eastern European writers, mm. like I really, that, you know, feeds my soul in a special way. So I wanted to ask you this question about assuming that you would like someone to read a, a poem at your funeral or memorial service. Oh. <laughs> is there one that you've already thought about or one that you would think that you would want oh, people to read man. and why that poem? That's a really interesting question because I, I'm probably, I'm going to answer it in a tangential Cancerian kind of way. Cause I, th- I think about death a lot. I think about my death a lot. My parents died young and I, and as I get older, you know, as I was saying, I'm just a couple of years older than you. So I, I, in fact, right before COVID, I was thinking, Oh, I need to get a, a cemetery plot. I need to get a, 
you know, I, I, I need to get a grave. It, it's going to happen at some point. And then COVID happened, which was weird. Um, those two things so close together. Mm-hmm. But uh, no, there wouldn't be any poem. No, no, no. If, if, it, if it's up to me, and I, I don't know if it would be, uh, <laughs> if it's up to me, I would have a, a traditional uh, Jewish funeral. Mm-hmm. So there wouldn't, there wouldn't be, you know, I love Rilke. There wouldn't be any Rilke or anyone from another Republic. Yeah. So it would be no poems. It would no be poems. as by the book, as strictly Orthodox as possible. I've only been Every to one. Every single ritual to a T. Uh, I've only been to one Jewish funeral and it was reformed. And the thing that so that that would be very different. Yeah, the thing I took away from it is when we went to the graveside, and mm, mm-hmm. people were invited to come and 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 put dirt on the grave, but to hold the shovel upside down to show the reluctance of saying goodbye mm. to that person, and it was just so incredibly moving. To just the yeah, way, that, just dirt, just yeah. dirt, no poems. <laughs> yeah, and I, and I was like, yeah, that. Yeah, that was that was one of those, those things that um, I felt very lucky not to have lost that person, but to have been invited into that space that I was unfamiliar with, and to to see the beauty of that service felt really special. So, mm. some of us are um, I was going to say some of us are close to death, but I, I mean that uh, in like it doesn't freak us out mm-hmm. going going to a funeral or taking care of a dying person or, you know, there's all kinds of ways it can show up. Yeah. I think though they're the magical unicorns too. Yeah. Well, yeah, no, I there's do. I, I do death kind people. of think that the death people might be magical unicorns because it, because if someone wants to take me to a funeral, I'm, I'm fine. Mm-hmm. In fact, and I, I had a friend recently who has, she has her death issues. Like she won't talk about it. We had a, she'll never hear this. So I'm just going <laughs> to talk about her without saying her name, but we had a mutual friend die and she didn't tell me cause she doesn't talk about those things. And I didn't, I didn't know till weeks later. And he was a traditional religious guy. And there was a, a Shiva, which is this uh, just a, a lot of Jewish ritual. And I was so I was so upset that I didn't have a chance to do that, mm-hmm. uh, um, to be part of it, to be part of this, this death ritual. Whereas if I had missed someone's wedding, like I really wouldn't fucking care. Like, oh yeah, I missed a wedding, but there's something about, I mean, I could explain some of it astrologically, but yeah. So I mean, back I, to the original question. Yeah. No poems. No poems. <laughs> no but, poems. I do, but I do think that's, I mean, that is a, that's a thoughtful thing in all of itself that, I mean, clearly it is not something that you shun thinking about. I, I have lost both my parents as well. Mm. And um, one when I was fairly young and, and one when I was older, but um, it, it is, I think having, I, my sister described this and I think about it a lot. She went to a, a, a friend's like parents funeral, I think. And, you know, in the South, a lot of funerals are also church services where sometimes they including having like an altar call to save you at the funeral kind of thing, which that has always nerved me a little bit, mm. but um, it's a whole, it's a whole thing if you haven't experienced it, but she said the, the minister good. who was doing the funeral was, was particularly attuned to the fact that there were lots of different kinds of people in the audience. And so it wasn't um, as, I guess that kind of way that sometimes Southern funerals can be. And he, the thing that she took away from it was he said, you know, when you've, when you've lost your grandparents and your parents and you're the person sitting on the front row at the funeral is when you start to realize that, you know, for some people, that's when they really realize that this is the progress of life is that you two mm. eventually will be the one the funeral is being held for. Mm. And and I that thought gave, that gave me chills. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, what? Uh, See, I wonder if I'll even have one. I don't even, who knows? I don't know. You know, I don't know who's going to remember me or, or yeah. make plans. Like, yeah. And I mean, I would be just as happy for people to have a party. <laughs> you know, it's like, 
whatever you feel like you need to do to make you feel better, I will be gone. So do what you need to do. It's kind of my thing a little bit, but um, I look forward to haunting people. That's my big plan. I do kind of hope I get to haunt people. <laughs> oh, you will. <laughs> That's going to be fun. Um, it's like, oh, uh, what is, <laughs> yeah. And I do that. I mean, you know, whatever people say about Scorpios aside, I mean, I, I have always been drawn to that, to, to thinking about what happens after we die and sure. rituals and, you know, it's just, and, you know, people find that really morbid and I don't know, I find yeah. it very life affirming in, in a different way, I guess. Yeah. It's, it's fun and juicy and yeah, I was, I was just thinking that thinking, reflecting on what I was just saying, like, Oh, people are going to think this is morbid, but whatever. <laughs> Yeah, I don't, I don't, I mean, yeah, I was a good little goth girl in the eighties, but you know, it it wasn't, but to me it was like, yes, cause this is, was it, I don't ever want to just have one emotion. I want to experience them all. And therefore I want to experience everything. You know, grief is not my favorite emotion, but it has its purpose and, um, it can be incredibly healing to let yourself grieve. I mean, a lot of people can't let themselves grieve. So yeah, I think we have to. I mean, if you can't even talk about death, it's gonna be really hard to grieve. <laughs> so. Yeah, that, that that was a shock with that. I mean, it taught me yeah. a lot of, about that friend and who she was. Yeah, like you think you think you know someone until you until you know someone. Mm-hmm. Um. So, so on that note, <laughs> on that note, uh, yeah, uh, death talk with Victoria and Elisa. <laughs> I like it. Death talk with Victoria and Elisa. New podcast coming when Elisa finishes <laughs> psycho psychoanalysis program in twenty years. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for real. Twenty years from now. Uh, well. Elisa, thank you so much for being on the show. I have enjoyed our conversation and um, I really enjoyed your book and I hope you find an agent for your memoir. <laughs> Amen. Thank you. Yes. that That's my only goal right now besides just main, well, it's, not my, it's my, my main wish, dream, hope. Well, I will send good thank energy you. out there and anybody who's thank listening, you. if you want to pitch in, please. Yeah, do. send it all, all the <laughs> so. good energy. Awesome. Well, when that comes out, we'll have you back and we'll talk about memoir writing. <laughs> Ooh, that'll be fun. Okay. Intention set. I'm going to do it. I feel like you just sealed it. You just see like she will get an agent because she's got to come back on the show and talk about it. I like it. I like it. Writing a memoir. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you too. Which Lit is a production of Thousand Volt Press. Our intro music is Cosmic Glow by Andrew Kay, and our outro music is Voices by Alexander Shinekar. Transcripts and all our previous episodes are available at witchlitpod.com, and you can follow us on Instagram at witchlitpod. Thanks for listening and for reading Witchy.